there's still a lot that needs to be done in terms of transparency and who owns our water here in the state of California, making sure that, that it doesn't get own, all owned up by private that could be based outside of the United States or outside of California. That's my biggest fear because once you have corporations that are from outside the U.S. or even corporations, period, that have a hold of the number one source of that you need to survive, that's that's something to be worried about. That's something that really keeps me up at night as well. And so I think there's a lot more in terms of what we need to do in California when it comes to water and the innovation. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today, we're joined by Melissa Hurtado. Senator Hurtado, thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's going well. A um, little bit of rain down in the Central Valley, so we're excited about that. Yeah, I know. You're kind of, yeah, I get, maybe you're used to this because your last election was like this too, but you're, you know, kind of waiting for results still. Uh, you know, you were down by a lot by election night, but I think today you're only down 350 votes. Uh, how's it looking and, and um, kind of what's the latest? Well, you know, kind of very similar to my first election, I wasn't expected to win and I remain optimistic and hopeful. And that's, you know, that is, that's as much as, <laughs> as I can do. And right. so my fight for this region, for this valley, it, it, it's never going to stop because this is where I was born and raised. This is where my family lives. And there's so much at stake that it's not like uh, I'm going to give up if, if things don't work out in terms of, you know, winning the Senate seat. But uh, I'm very optimistic that the numbers, I mean, they're trending in our way and we're making sure that every vote is getting counted and that's what we're waiting for. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, I remember like when I took the bar exam and then you just had to wait, you know, months to find out your future. Uh, so I kind of, kind of empathize with how, how you might feel right now, kind of wait, wait your future, kind of, how have you been spending, I guess, your time since the election, kind of just kind of waiting these results out? Yeah, well, I, I think that it's not, it's not just me. I mean, I think I'm a little bit more at peace. Um, of course, my family is <laughs> a little anxious. Uh, for a moment there, I thought my dad was about to have a stroke when he, he saw there was kind of like an uphill battle there for us. Um, and I have to say that it also leaves, more importantly, our constituents really in, in limbo because there's so many issues that are going on right now. And really, you know, we, with swearing in on Monday, we still don't have uh, an understanding of, of the, the clear winner in the seat and the, the constituents need a, a representative. And so um, they're kind of in limbo as well. And, and you know, having met with you know, farmers earlier this week and talking about you know, water shortages and impacts to to the region. I think uh, they have it the worst, quite frankly. Yeah, it's kind of weird. You're going to be in this transition spot. It's a it's a new district. Uh, you know, things are changing kind of what what's top of mind on, on some of these constituents that you're hearing from right now? Water. I mean, for a very long time, it has been water and it continues to be water, but I think it goes a little bit beyond that. I mean, I think they're very worried about the cost of, of living, similar to across the state. Uh, they're worried about um, you know, being able to feed their, their families. And so, uh, but water is still at the forefront because water really kind of, that's what, you know, the community uh, relies on for, uh, for jobs and whatnot. Yeah, kind of. We had this kind of uh, great host. We had a Alexandra Baring uh, on from uh, one of the canals down there, kind of explaining the water situation down in the valley. And she was talking about basically, if not, if more water isn't allocated to the Central Valley, you're looking at a million less acres being farmed down there in about ten years, uh, which would be devastating to to the local economy. Kind of what what steps are being taken to make sure that doesn't happen? <laughs> I would, I mean, I think that it's, uh, it's difficult to say that, that there's, there's steps taken to, to prevent that. And it's easy to say, okay, we're going to fallow X amount of land and because there's not enough wa water. I mean, quite frankly, in my humble opinion, I think we haven't been managing our water well. And so if we have, you know, 
water that is managed well, then I think we'd have a little bit more for us to 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 really uh, thrive. Obviously, we need to make changes. We need to change the way that we that we that we grow our crops. We need to invest in in, in, in innovative solutions. Um, but people don't really think realize. I think that. Um, when you fallow land, when you fallow, uh, you're, you're fallowing essentially food that comes to or to our to our plates at home, and I think that that's uh, something that's really concerning around the world, not just in the Central Valley. Uh, I think that's a lot of um, some you know farmers and countries that are are facing a drought as well. Uh, are worried about about our food supply chain and how they're going to survive um given that we're we're growing less crops and yeah. it's a growing population so you know, yeah i remember last time we met you know you talked about you're taking a real deep dive into kind of the water and the regulatory world and and how water is is kind of regulated and managed uh in this state kind of what do you know today after spending the last year kind of really digging in on this stuff that you didn't that you didn't know last year at this time that you think you know could really help us move forward. Well, I feel like I'm learning every day, and uh, I think there's there's still a lot that needs to be done in terms of uh, transparency and who owns our water here in the state of California. Making sure that uh, that it doesn't get you know all 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 owned up by private uh, interests that could be based outside of the United States or outside of California. That's my biggest fear because, uh, you know, once you have um, corporations that are from, uh, you know, outside the U.S. or even corporations, period, um, that have a hold of a number one source of that you need to survive, that's, that's something to be worried about. That's something, to, you know, that really keeps me up at night as well. And so I think there's a lot more in terms of what we need to do in California when it comes to water and the innovation, but also making sure that the science is clear that we're, you know, every project that we're um, working on to, uh, that has to do with water, that that it's science-based, that it's proven, and that there aren't any scams involved because I feel that that's something that climate change is, is bringing. Right. One of the challenges is that there's 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 a way to make money off of uh, uh, creating solutions uh, to or adapting to climate change. Uh, and with that, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity, honestly, for, for scams. And we need to be um, at the forefront of making sure that every single taxpayer dollar is is to benefit um, to benefit the, the, the taxpayers. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, like when. You know, I'd say maybe like 99% of climate change talk is about transportation um, and energy, but not much of it is spent on agriculture, which is is probably probably one of the top places we should spend is agriculture and water. Kind of, I, I know you've you know you've been around and you've gone to a lot of these conferences. Kind of, what are some of the hopes are around the world and, and new technologies you know to help us deal with the water shortages and climate change? Well, a lot of it is focused around data. <laughs> Uh, making sure that we account for every drop of water is what we're hearing. And, and I think that around the world, they're looking to California, they're looking to the United States to be the innovators of these solutions that are that are really going to stabilize um, uh, countries and, and communities around the world. And so I, I, I have no doubt in my mind that um, that Californians, the people in the Central Valley, that people in the United States, can be the the innovators uh, of the solutions that we need to fight climate change. Um, we just we really need to kind of redirect our focus in a way to focus in on agriculture. And I know having coming back from COP twenty seven, there's a lot of focus on a nexus between you know agriculture and, and energy, uh, and, and also water. And so we we really got to think about it um, as a whole rather than in, in parts. And, Quite frankly, agriculture is, is really where the solution is, and the farmers are really at the forefront at, at fighting climate change. So we need to be taking their consideration and their input more into account. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, and just reading books, they compare kind of 
Sacramento and the, the Central Valley is 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 you know really an arid arid climate, very similar to maybe some some areas of the Middle East um, and average rainfall and stuff like that. Um, kind of being over there in Egypt and at the COP twenty seven, uh, you know what what did you see over there that how they're handling agri agriculture and kind of lack of water issues over there? Well, I didn't really get to do a, a tour of, of Egypt, but uh, I mean, I think they're really struggling in terms of water quality. And it's a very poor country. They, they, don't, they don't really have the, um, the, the funding uh, to, to really step up and, and provide you know, innovative solutions. And so I think you know, with that water quality, poor water quality also means um, health impacts. And, and, and so I know I had to get all these different vaccinations going to Egypt. Um, and, and there's, there's a connection there between, uh, a good, good water, uh, and water quality and, and adequate amount of water to health outcomes. So we really, uh, need to also think about it in, in that framework because, uh, health really and, and the food we eat, they're all kind of, they're all interconnected. And so, um, again, I think that uh, countries like Egypt and beyond are looking to the United States, they're looking to California, the state that has always been known as to be, be bring innovation, uh, the, that has Silicon Valley, that has is just so much talent. And so uh, they're looking to us to really be the 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 innovators and, and to bring the solutions to the water shortages and the water challenges. Uh, I, I guess we'll have to get to work here then. I was hoping they had a solution for us. <laughs> no, 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 no solution yet. But I, you know, I did a little bit of uh, reading and I watched a documentary before I went to, to Egypt on uh, the Nile and the history of the Nile and how, you know, they went from, there used to be you know, a million people that lived along the, the, the Nile river and how it used to expand and, they had a they worried about um, the, the water the, um, really, you know, killing the crops and how they created like little canals to deal with that. And, and so uh, it, it's just really interesting to, to know how the challenges that we in a way are facing today have been, you know, mankind has been dealing with them for a very long time. And obviously I think that the difference are the, the challenges are a little bit different now because of the, we're just living in a different time, but um, yeah. they're still very similar in many ways. You know, it's interesting, kind of, you know, the, the more I learn about agriculture, I kind of, the, the more I wonder why this isn't kind of at the forefront of, of issues here in, in California. You know, we provide so much of the, the world's food and, you know, we have, you know, a, a lot of, of farmers here that are, are in need of kind of help with, with water and other issues. And, and, it, you know, it's kind of explained to me as, you know, where else would you want your food to come from? You know, where we have, you know, workers rights laws and we take care of our workers and our, and our land and we ensure that our food is, is, uh, you know, grown in a, in a manner that is acceptable to us. So, you know, basically if we don't take care of our agriculture, then we're going to have to import it from somewhere else. And they might not have the same values and standards of California. Um, you know, wh why isn't that message kind of resonating more with, you know, your colleagues here in Sacramento and, and what does it take to kind of get agriculture more of the forefront of, of issues here? Well, you know, I, I, I think that with, with my colleagues, um, they don't represent the region. They weren't born and raised in the region. So much like I wasn't born in San Francisco or in LA, I can't really understand, you know, their issues, but I think there's, you know, really got to be an opportunity to um, have more conversations about agriculture, agriculture and the role that it plays in, in our economy, but also in the stability of our democracy. I think that when we talk about climate change, um, climate change is impacting us in so many ways that we don't even think or talk about. Um, and, and, and food being the one um, area where it, it's, it, it, that's, that's what's being impacted right now by climate change. And so that impacts people all over the world, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to impact us because it, it's not going to leave anyone behind in terms of it, when there's less food around the world, that means there's less food for everybody, not just poor countries. And yes, we are in, uh, relying more on importing food into the U.S., to me, I feel that's a bit of a concern because the, the quality of the food is not the same because they don't have the same standards as we do, which brings issues of, of food safety. Uh, and then also, uh, 
it, I think it just leaves us vulnerable. It leads it, to, to have to rely on uh, other nations for all of our food. That's a really, for me, that's a really scary thing. I don't know if it is for others. And so I think that's something that we need to have more conversations about because uh, it, you know, climate change is also going to, um, in a way, kind of uh, pin one country against another because of these challenges with water shortages and and food shortages. And we're already in a in a global food crisis, and the situation in California is going to make it that much worse. Yeah, kind of as as you kind of explained is like you know every member is is familiar with what they grew up with and what they're surrounded with. Um, you know, we've had the the pleasure of of talking with uh, Robert Rivas before and kind of learning about his background. And um, as you may be aware, he is an impending speaker coming on on the assembly side. How do you think a, a speaker with agricultural roots and background can help kind of bring this issue forward and help kind of the state figure some of these issues out? Well, I, I think for any leader, um, it, it, you're you kind of have to know a little bit about all the you know the districts that are within you know within the the state um and so i i think that given the the role that california is taking in in fighting climate change i i would assume that uh a, you know a leader with some knowledge uh in or a, a lot of knowledge in this area would perhaps um put it at the forefront of how we need to this is this is a climate change issue that we need to really heavily work on and i i would love to see i would love to see that i don't know if that that's going to be the case but i i think that the conversations at least from what i heard in at cop 27 the direction is to really the to put agriculture at the forefront of, of as as tackling climate change yeah. You know, we, we've had a lot of water experts on and, and it first became, you know, a search of, well, if we have water shortage, we need more water. Right. And what's the way to get more water? Is it desal? Is it recycled water? And then some experts believe is, is we don't have a water shortage. We have a an allocation problem. Our, our ability to move the water from one area to another efficiently isn't quite there. And if we could efficiently move the water from one spot to another, that would solve a lot of our water issues. Kind of looking at this, do you think we have a water shortage issue or, or do you think a more efficient delivery system could really help us go a long way? Yeah, I think, again, it goes back to water management. I think we have poor water management. And yes, that means that uh, we, I think, I do believe that we have a, a, you know enough water for you know, 4 million people that live in California. I do believe that we have enough water for agriculture as well. But I don't think that we're adequately managing our water. And, and that means that um, we haven't been investing in a, you know, aging infrastructure. I mean, that's something that I worked on over the last four years is making sure that we repair our uh, canals that have you know, uh, sunken a, a little bit or quite a bit. And so that means that water is, is lost, significant amount of water is lost in that process. Water that right now we need. And so I think that, yes, we have a poor, you know, we have poor water management problems here in the California and enough water really to, to be able to provide for everyone. Yeah. I, I know you've pushed a lot for kind of funding, kind of to, to, to clean the canals up and kind of bring our infrastructure up to date. Um, and I know you've, you've kind of met some resistance on that kind of what feedback have you received from the governor's office on why they don't, you know, prioritize funding kind of these canals and these infrastructure projects? You know, this conversation about providing funding for infrastructure for these canals, uh, you know, the governor's office has put money in for funding, $200 million. Obviously, there's a, a lot more that we need. Uh, I think that um, the conversation or, or uh, the arguments against uh, funding is that the federal government really needs to step up and, and fund them. I don't disagree with that. I think that um, there, there needs to be that the, the federal contribution component to it, um, but I, I feel that this is this is you know, the governor's office has really been the only ones that maybe maybe there's some resistance there, but they they provided funding in the budget, and so it, it's it's a little bit it's not enough, but it's something to get these projects going that are keeping people in the Central Valley employed and that are also. Um, moving these projects along that will uh, hopefully 
um, be able to save water, water that we just that we'll need over the, the next couple of years. Yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping that that um, the conversation will uh, will continue and that we can get additional funding to fix our, our aging infrastructure. I know you've worked a lot on kind of drought impact legislation, kind of how have you seen that legislation unfold and kind of impact the Central Valley and kind of help alleviate some of the issues? <laughs> I think that, you know, sometimes some of these investments like the, the 200 million, some of it you're, you're seeing it immediately the, the work that is, um, that is, there's been worked on, right, the canals but it's going to take a while for it to be completed. And, and ultimately it's going to take a while for us to see the additional, that additional water. Um, I, I think uh, that we have been working on, on legislation. Some of it hasn't been successful in, in, in you know, moving it, in moving it forward. I mean, we've been talking about how uh, you know, farm workers um, are struggling during the drought. We um, pushed for, um, you know, kind of incentive, incentive pay or, or drought uh, relief pay for farm workers that didn't make it through. But that's also a conversation that that is uh, being held kind of at, at, you know, at the, at the global level of how do we support and, and you know, farm workers because yeah. they're key to, to farming. Uh, so that's that's one. Um, you know, small communities that rely on that, that have run out of water, like um, you know, Kalinga or Lindsay, that rely on surface water to 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 meet their needs of the community. They have been we've been not through legislation, but actually just uh, you know writing letters uh, to the Bureau of Reclamation, those, having conversations, those those types of things to be able to provide them with that additional water, so the communities don't go without water. Um, other communities like Tiviston, for example, um, we, we, we really um, tried to bring to light uh, through, through, through media how they were without water. And they got funding to provide them with the infrastructure they need to have uh, reliable water. So there's, there's a lot of different things that, that my team and I have been working on to, to make sure that these communities don't go without water. But there's, it, the communities is just one one component. There's also the farm workers uh, and, and the farmers too. Um, with farmers right now, they're struggling with stigma. There's many farmers that are going to go basically out of business. They're they're just going to stop farming because they, there's all these different penalties that are that they are uh, having to uh, pay uh, and because of stigma and and the implementation of it at the local level. That's that's I, I think when it comes to land being fallowed because of less water, I think Sigma is impacting um, farmers and our food supply at, at a faster rate than than having to fallow land because of water shortages. That we're and, and, I, I, and I guess for our listeners who don't know, what, what is Sigma? The Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, it was uh, passed uh, several a couple of laws that were passed. Uh, before my time, before I got to the legislature, but the whole idea was to bring balance to to, um, to groundwater. Oh, okay, and so basically, they're the way they're using their groundwater is is uh, causing difficulty for them to continue their operations. Yeah, I mean, look, when it comes to the drought, uh, what I tell people what what is scary is that when you have less groundwater and less surface water. Uh, you're going to start looking to desal water, right? And it's important to make sure that we have uh, groundwater sustainability, that we um, that we just don't uh, completely let our aquifers go dry because that's bad for communities, that's bad for agriculture, that's bad for everybody. Right. And so uh, I don't think farmers disagree with with um, the need to balance ground. Uh, uh, provide sustainability for our groundwater, but uh, I think that there's there's a lot of different issues that they're facing right now at the local level under their um, their local agencies, like, the, for example, um, they're getting asked to pay fees for water that they extract from underground. Well, some of them are saying, I didn't even have my water pump on. How can I be 
how, how am I expected to pay for water that I never extracted? So there's a lot of um, issues and questions around uh, the technology that is being used to determine how much water is being extracted. And so it, that's, I think, something that we uh, you know, in the legislature need to work on uh, because, I, again, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of flawed information, a lot of flawed tools out there that are being used that are going to impact communities and people. And they're being used as a way to tackle climate change. And that's why I think, we, you know, as the president said, we need to follow the science and, and be, um, it's got to be based on science. Yeah, that's interesting. And I guess kind of to pull it back to your district a bit here. Um, so I guess what's what would be your official last day of office? Would it be Friday? I believe so. Yes. <laughs> um, and so I guess kind of like it's kind of like this weird kind of awkward because like what happens Monday? Like when when will these results be final? And I guess how many counties are counting and kind of uh, I guess, you know, as you kind of said, kind of your constituents are in limbo right now and, and it doesn't serve anyone. So kind of what what's the update on when, you know, I guess clarity will be provided and you can decide, you know, whether you're going to get a work or, or what? <laughs> I wish I had an answer for you, but I, I really, <laughs> I really don't. I mean, every day people call me, hey, what's the update? Well, I wish I had an update for you. And I thought things would be a little more clear today, but they're not. And so I think, um, you know, more importantly, I think that every vote needs to be counted, whether it goes my way or not. Uh, and and uh, that that is taking time, and uh, we're we're right now. I think we're just waiting on Kern County. I think there's about 25 or so ballots left in Fresno County. Tulare and Keynes County are are done. Uh, so just it, we're waiting on on for the most part on Kern County to um, be able to provide us with uh, the updates. And I think that the next the next update will be on on Friday or tomorrow. So uh, it could be tomorrow that we'll have a better understanding. It could be Monday, it could be Tuesday. I believe they have until the 8th to provide their, their you know, the information to Secretary of State. So I, I, I'm hopeful that we have an answer soon because yes, it, it, we, we just need, um, the, the constituents need to know uh, they're asking every day. Right. So there's how many ballots in Kern County left? I, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I believe the last time I checked, there was like 2000 ballots left. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. So still a lot more counting to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time with us and uh, kind of talk with us about water and some of the issues you're facing and uh, you know, look forward to those results on Friday and hopefully we'll, we'll see, you'll get some good news and we'll see you here on Monday. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Melissa.